chapter 10, God's balanced universe, God created this majestically balanced, beautiful universe in which man slowly unfolds into the heaven of eternal peace and happiness in the measure in which he comprehends the one great principle of balance in nature. Peace and happiness can never come in any other way than through that knowledge and its application. Balance is the key to happiness. Balance is the key to all other attainment. It is the key to what we think of as normalcy. That which we think of as abnormalcy is a transaction in nature which has not been completed as a balanced transaction. Unhappiness, misery, the agonies of war, the frustrations of life, the crippled and the blind, the diseased and the sick, all of these are not normal because all are the result of uncompleted transactions in life which leave a residue of unbalance in them. Nature never allows abnormalities to occur which will in any way upset the balance of the universe. To restore balance, she will cause hurricanes to equalize opposite temperature and pressure conditions. She will cause a continent to rise from the ocean or sink under it to adjust unbalanced conditions in earth densities. The ocean bed itself is constantly undulating to equalize earth's pressures. Every transaction between the two electric forces of nature is always completed. It begins in zero and ends in zero. No residue remains. Nature is so completely balanced that the slight effort of a child throwing a ball in the air causes every star in the heaven to contract and expand in unison with the change of pressures caused by that slight action. Planets revolve around the sun with such completely balanced precision that their position can be mathematically calculated for thousands of years ahead. You could point a telescope into the heavens towards blank space and prophesy that Jupiter could be seen at that point in the heavens a thousand years from now, and it will appear there on time, not one second late and not a hundredth of a degree out of line. If our lives were as balanced as that, there could not be a moment of unhappiness, pain, sickness, or any other departure from normalcy in them. Our earth has its own perfectly balanced position in space from which it never varies one second in a trillion years. It constantly moves to keep that balanced position, but it is moving in balance with every other planet in the system which also must move in unison. If this earth had free will to do as it chose, as man has, and moved out of its orbit for even one hour, not one man would be left alive on it. The oceans would sweep everything off its surface, and the cataclysmic disaster which would follow such a seemingly trivial event in our solar family. When the earth got back to its proper position after such an escapade, the normal calm would return, but life and growth would have to start all over again as the affairs of men have to start all over again after unbalanced escapades in their businesses. In the meantime, the man or woman who got off their balanced path for a little escapade, which seemed too small to affect them, manufactured a lot of unhappiness for themselves. That is what I mean by saying that happiness and peace are impossible of attainment when people are out of their balanced normal orbits. Assume for a moment that all the planets in the solar system strayed from their paths even just a little. Immediately their inharmonious coexistence would cause a solar disaster which would be like a cosmic cyclone in the solar family. Men do that, however, and wonder why they are unhappy and why there is so much suffering and misery in the world. When thousands of businessmen go off their paths by over-optimism or greed, they bring down upon their heads a world depression or panic. 
when nations tried to take from each other to enrich one by impoverishing the other, two violently unbalanced conditions are created which cause wars. Wars are effects of unbalance which have their cause in man, yet millions pray to God to stop wars which man created. If happiness, peace, success, and all that is good is attainable only by obeying the law of balance, the more we comprehend that principle, the more we will be able to keep the human family in orbits which balance with one another as God keeps his solar family in balance. For this reason, let us return to the basic principle of undivided and unconditioned oneness in which balance itself is undivided. Motion is impossible under such, under such a condition. Also, effect is impossible without motion. There must be two extended conditions which are divided from one to make motion and effect possible. Witness two children sitting together in one united balance condition in the middle of a seesaw. Motion is impossible, so cause and effect are impossible. When the children are divided and extended to the end of the seesaw, they still cannot move for they are in balance with each other and with their fulcrum source. They must interchange with each other by giving and re-giving to each other to create motion and effect. Two unbalanced conditions are immediately established which will remain unchanged if the equality of interchange is not varied. The moment that balanced interchange is not equal, however, disaster begins. You can now understand that God cannot dramatize his one idea of love without dividing it and extending it and causing motion between the two by interchanging their divided love as the two children on the seesaw were divided and extended for interchanging purposes. He created man and woman to know love and to manifest love by giving and re-giving love to each other and to all creating things. He divided man and woman equally in order that they might find unity in each other and interchange equally with each other. To divide man and woman unequally would be like putting a man on one end of the seesaw and a little girl on the other end. He divided all creation into equal pairs in order that all divided pairs could find unity in each other through mutual interchange with each other. For God, the sexless father mother of creation divided all creating things into oppositely sexed pairs of fathers and mothers in order that they may unite to continue God's creation by forever producing more fathers and mothers. This God did to all things in his creation, to all creatures above the earth and beneath the seas, to all elements of matter which compose all bodies, to all suns, all stars of all the heavens, and to the majestic galaxies which give birth to his suns and stars. The oneness of all things he divided to make them appear to be countless many things and many ideas instead of but one. He divided them into countless twos and impregnated them with sex urge to attain sexlessness through balanced interchange between the two. He divided his light into days and nights and made each one give birth to the other one eternally. He made the dark to give birth to light and the light to give birth to dark. He divided his life into the life which comes with each inbreathing and that other life called death by man which goes with each outbreathing. He made life to give birth to death and death to give birth to life. He divided matter from space and commanded that each forever give and re-give equally that which he has to the other. Likewise, he made space to give birth to matter through their mutual interchange and matter to give birth to space. He divided suns and earths into equal interchanging mates and placed an equator between their hemispheres to balance their interchanging. He divided his pure white visible light into equal red and blue halves and placed an equator of pure white light between the two. He divided the stillness of his universe of rest into vibrating opposed pairs of mates to create interchanging motion where not 
but universal rest is. He divided his balance zero of temperature into cold and heat and made each to give birth to the other. He divided his knowing into two-way thinking to create a balanced, two-way sexed electric universe of interchanging waves to stimulate the idea of his imagining in moving forms made in his image. Above all other things of import in his creation, he divided his unconditioned balance into two unbalanced conditions to produce effects of motion between interchanging parts. He likewise made one inviolable law to govern and control all interchanging between all pairs. I will now give you that one law that governs and controls all motion in the universe, which includes everything you do every moment of your life. And do not forget that you and I and everything in the universe are governed and controlled by that one law. Do not forget also that whatever is wrong with your health or business or any other thing which affects your happiness or world happiness is caused by either your ignorance of that law or by its defiance. Do not forget also that whatever ignorance you may have regarding the forces which control your destiny and your moment-to-moment -moment happiness is due to the fact that you cannot see those forces. You cannot see the invisible universe. That is why man ignores it, yet the invisible universe absolutely controls the visible universe. You cannot see gravity, electricity, balance, or truth, yet you are controlled by all of them. They command you, and you either obey them and find harmony, or you disobey them and create discord. If you defy truth by telling a lie, you hurt yourself. If you defy gravity, you destroy yourself. If you defy balance in any respect, you punish yourself in the measure of your defiance. Whatever you do in obedience to that law or in defiance of it, you are doing to yourself. Herein follows God's one inviolable law, which all creation must obey or suffer the consequences of disobedience. My one command to all sex-divided pairs of opposites in all my universe is that there shall be balanced, risen, rhythmic interchange in all their givings and re-givings, that being from the divine Iliad. The unbalanced and disunited man-made world we now live in is entirely due to man's ignorant defiance of this one law of balanced interchange in the giving and re-giving of oppositely divided pairs of creating people and things. Every ill which attacks mankind or causes unhappiness, frustration, or agony is due to unbalance in his actions. Has that thought ever occurred to you? If you are suffering from heart disease or cancer, has it ever occurred to you that you yourself created it as surely as you, back, as you baked a cake this morning? You did it by defying God's law of balance in some respect. Nature is normal because it is balanced. Any so-called abnormality in nature anywhere is due to unbalance. Your heart disease is an abnormal condition. Wherever nature is given a chance, she restores all abnormalities to normal conditions of balance. The secret of mind healing lies in the power which is in mind to command unbalanced conditions in people to become balanced. Jesus had that power because he knew the law. He could extend his balance to others because balance was in him. He could command because his knowledge gave him the power to obey no one can obey that which he does not know, nor can anyone command who has not first learned to obey, nor can anyone heal beyond his power to obey. I wonder why the world has not yet discovered this fact. There is terrible suffering everywhere just because of it. Everyone has a dozen minor sufferings daily because of it, and the world has the tragic sufferings of war and hatreds of human enmities because of it. Normalcy requires knowledge to attain and to preserve. The human race is very slowly acquiring that knowledge over its aeons of unfolding. The growth of spiritual awareness transforms humanity only a little at a time during each successive lifetime. Have you heard it said 
that age brings wisdom, meaning that wisdom is the result of a life of countless experiences. If the cause of all the blessings of the world had to be answered in one world, or I'm sorry, in one word, that one word would be balance. Conversely, the one word answer to all the world's ills would be unbalance. Do you not realize then that the human race can only rid itself of its various ills, its wars, its degenerative diseases, its frustrations, failures, hatreds, and minor unhappiness and annoyances through long ages of countless experiences which teach wisdom? From this point to the end of the book, I will explain in detail why all of the afflictions which come to you or me or to all human beings are due to the fact that we have not yet become sufficiently aware of God's one law to know how to obey it. We have not had enough experiences to become wise, or we have not profited by those experiences which we have had. The entire lesson of life and for ages of lives is to learn how to equally unite the pairs of opposite conditions of nature by equal interchange between those conditions, which alone result in attaining a balanced state. Until you know how to obey, you most certainly cannot command, and you must have knowledge in order to obey. When you do finally acquire that knowledge, you will know the cause of your heart ailment and its source in yourself. When that time comes and you're knowing, you can then command your heart ailment to disappear. It will obey your command to disappear as surely as it obeyed your invitation to appear. It cannot do otherwise. This new age, which marks the beginning of a new knowledge in electronics, is also beginning to comprehend the principle of mind power to command matter, which Jesus alone knew and practiced with resultant certainty. Knowledge of principles, now being written herein, will vastly further this growing new power of man to heal and to avoid the necessity of having to heal. It might take many reincarnations of your body to have enough experiences to give you the wisdom and knowledge that you can gain in a few weeks by deeply meditating over these principles. If you will but think of them into your soul, you will speedily acquire that power. Remember, however, that you cannot acquire knowledge through your senses. If you just read this book to remember it, you will have but recorded pictures of the words upon your brain to remember and repeat. You do not know it. However, until you think it inwardly through deep meditation while alone with God, until the wave vibrations which electrically record information on your brain have found stillness in your centering intelligence, you do not know it. You have acquired no power through sensing any effect because power comes only with knowledge. In order to help you comprehend my meaning, the following can be used as a key to aid your understanding. You cannot know effects. You can only sense them by seeing, hearing, feeling, smelling, or tasting them. You can know only the cause of effects. You cannot see cause. All cause lies in the invisible universe, and all effects lie within the visible. You cannot see gravity or balance or energy or truth or God, but you can know them. You can see a sunset sky and you can comprehend it, but you cannot know it. That which is transient or in motion cannot be known. The cause of anything cannot be found in matter, for matter is effect which can be sensed but not known. All cause stems from mind, not from product of mind. Likewise, you will much more readily comprehend the law of rhythmic balance interchange between equally divided pairs of opposites by giving you some examples of the manner in which nature obeys the law. Remember the one fact that nature never takes. Nature gives and re-gives equally. The important thing to remember is that the electric division of the universal equilibrium into pairs of opposite conditions is equal throughout all nature. Likewise, her givings and receivings are equal and in reverse. A balanced universe would be impossible otherwise. Consider your interchange of breathing. That which is given you to breathe in from space is re-given equally by your breathing out. Unless they are balanced, you could not survive. 
the earth gives you your body, which you must equally re-give to earth, these must balance even to a milligram. If you throw a ball in the air, you discharge the potential of the earth and add to the charge of space. When the ball returns to it, equally discharges space and charges earth. Likewise, the ascending ball loses speed as it rises to its highest point. When it falls back toward earth, it gains speed in equal but reverse ratio. Like the borrower of money from a bank, the ascending ball is constantly being credited on one side of nature's ledger and debited on the other side. When it comes to rest, the transaction is completely voided by uniting the two unbalanced conditions as one balanced. Therein lies the whole secret of nature's continuity. The rhythmic interchange between the two conditions of debit and credit are so balanced at all times in their equality that there is no result in tension during a transaction or afterward. Each effect has canceled its opposite effect. Both conditions are unbalanced in relation to their separateness, but each separate half is counterbalanced in the other at all times. When any such transaction is completed, it cancels out both unbalanced conditions. Nature always completes her transactions. Her books always balance. There are no accumulating residues of unbalance anywhere in her transactions. Man seldom completes his transactions in any of the many departments of his life. He is continually interchanging with many pairs of opposite conditions, and hardly any of them in balance with each other or are ever canceled out. That is what is the matter with each individual life and the collective life, which has made such an unbalanced world as our world is. That is why John Doe dies at 40 when his normal right to live is 80. In some, perhaps unknown, unbalanced transaction lies the answer to why Tom Smith was born a hunchback and your neighbor's child is subnormal. Unbalanced transactions are recorded in the seed as accurately as balanced ones. Any unbalanced transaction which affects the seed pattern takes several generations to normalize. Very often, God is blamed for allowing a child to be born blind when the cause of it may be traceable to a venereal disease in a parent or grandparent. There is a beautiful tree in our garden with large branches on one side and stunted ones on the other side. Unbalanced distribution of sunlight caused that defect. All such defects in your life and in nature have their cause an unbalanced interchange between the two conditions which have created them. In unbalanced lies the reason why your husband walked away from you. Every transaction in nature has the connotation of mating, and mates must be equal for the product of mating to be normal. All problems and unhappy conditions of man are due to a breach somewhere of the law of balance. That is what causes unhappy marriages. A happy marriage unites two unbalanced conditions into one and cancels out the two. Uniting two mates into one means simultaneously canceling out the divided two. When the minister says, Whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder, he assumes by that that the two whom he has attempted to unite as one are equal mates. If they actually are equal mates, God has actually joined them together and no man could put them asunder if he tried. Very few marriages are between equal mates, however. There are tremendous residues of unbalanced in a very large percentage of them. In such cases, God has not joined them together. They are still two, for unequal mates cannot become one any more than two halves of two differently sized apples can become one symmetrically and equally balanced apple. Marriage between mates does not mean that sex alone must be balanced. Humans have many pairs of divided conditions which must be voided by uni unity other than just sex alone. Divided humans are lonely. Loneliness creates an injurious tension which is completely voided by companionship. 
Divided humans have innumerable pairs of divided interests which become one when united, and I mean united, not shared. When that great rarity of marriage between two equally unbalanced mates voids their separateness completely, they become united as one in all conditions, not just sex alone. Let us consider other perfect marriages which nature is so rich in and man so poor. In a wave of water, the amount of water which is above its level equals the amount which is below. That makes a perfect unity possible when the divided mates meet and marry at the crests and troughs of waves. So long as that perfect equality of division between opposite mate pairs is continued, they will be rhythmically repeated. The moment that the slightest inequality between the two unbalanced conditions takes place, however, then the danger of a crash begins. In deep waters, this will not happen, but when the sand slopes up to the water's edge, it becomes increasingly impossible for there to be as much water under the ocean level as above it. Continuity then becomes impossible, and the waves crash on the shore as inevitably as happiness crashes in homes, thus unequally balanced. If your car gives you a smooth and pleasant ride, you do not even think of your engine. However, you would immediately think of it if its vibration suddenly threatened to shake you from your seat. If such a thing did happen, it would be because of an unbalanced relationship between the two piston strokes, which must continually unite their conditions and reverse them in order to repeat them. You definitely know that you could not continue to drive such a car. It would be dangerous for you and would shake your car to pieces if it continued. The most majestic example of a successful and harmonious marriage in all nature is that of the interchange between those two opposite conditions, which we call matter and space. There we find a perfection of balance which spreads out to infinity without the slightest variance of balance between the vast suns and stars in the universe. Any marriage which could even approach being in tune with the infinite would be the most unified marriage on earth. Consider how orderly the planets revolve around the sun with such moment-to-moment -moment precision that an astronomer, mathemat mathematician, can tell where any one of them is to the split second or where they will be a thousand years from now. That is the way God keeps his home and his millions of solar and stellar families happily in balance. Solar families must constantly adjust their own desires to harmonize with every unit in them, just as human families should do, but rarely do. Every planet and moon in the entire solar system moves at tremendous speeds around the sun, but each one of them has to constantly change its speed to keep a harmonious rhythm in the entire system. The speed of the Earth around the sun is never the same for one moment. It increases its speed for six months, and then reduces it for another six months. Every other unit in the solar system does likewise. There are so many interchanging relations in these great solar families, which have no free will to violate God's law, that they would fill the rest of this book, but a study of them would tell why God's universe is eternally balanced and why man's families so frequently destroy themselves. It is difficult to parallel solar examples in human life, for humans have free will in making decisions, whereas the stars of heaven are God-guided, they have no free will. Man's opportunity for self-expression began when he first discovered that he could make decisions of his own without having to obey the commands of God, instinctive guidance. That is when he began to assert his free will for self-interest rather than community interest. He chose to think of himself and what he wanted for himself without any consideration for the desires of others. He took what he wanted for himself by the might of his physical strength. He has not yet arrived at the stage in his unfolding where he has become aware 
that he is not a separate unit of creation, but an integral part of the whole. He still insists upon taking without knowing that his taking is impoverishing him. He has not yet learned that he can be enriched only by giving. He has not yet learned of his unity with mankind. He still has not learned that every thought and action of his must be for mankind and not for himself. More important than all else is the fact that he has not yet learned that his free will to do as he chooses is limited to just that and no more. He has the right to his action, but God holds the right to the reaction, and they must balance. No matter what the agony may be to him who has to balance an unlawful action. It takes a long time and countless experiences for humanity to learn that God is forever working with every unit of his creation who is working with him, but he will not work for any unit of it who is working in defiance of him. Human beings still think of themselves as independent, separate individuals who are in full control of their destinies and can do what they choose to hurt others without hurting themselves. Those who have learned the lesson that God is forever working with them are the enlightened ones who alone can save the human race from another fall if it is not too late to save it. These are the ones who have learned that their own personal identity is merged in the destiny of the universal man whom he is. He knows that he is not of himself alone. He knows that all men and all created things are one. That is the lesson which all men must learn, no matter how many lives they must live. That is the lesson they must learn about their relations with other men. But there is still a greater lesson that they must learn. That lesson is how to find their own center of control while learning how to deal with other men. That is the lesson man slowly learns which removes him further and further from the treadmill of mere existence and nearer to the spiritual power of mind-knowing, which gives him rest and freedom from life's treadmill. The following are God's own words to man in relation to balance. I have but one law for all my opposed pairs of creating things, and that law needs but one word to spell it out. So hear me when I say that one word of my one law is balance. And if man needs two words to aid him in his knowing of the workings of that law, those words are balanced interchange. If man needs more words to aid his knowing of my one law, give to him one another give to him another one and let those three words be rhythmic balanced interchange also from the divine iliad okay again incredible stuff here i uh, hope you're enjoying it and, and picking up on these things and um, spending some time meditating on them afterwards have a good one